I'm sure he's a different man now than what he was eight years ago, but even still, you know, you, you can't say things like that or think, even think things like that, as I said, let alone in a public sphere. Hello and welcome to episode number nine of Rugby Pass Offload with me, Christina Mahan, and today I'm joined by Dylan Hartley and Jamie Roberts. We're brought to you once more by Amazon Prime Video. You can watch the final round of the Autumn Nations Cup this weekend live and exclusive on Amazon Prime Video with Dylan and Jamie involved too. Just visit primevideo.com to start your free trial today. How are you guys? Not bad, thank you. Um, an absolute shocker at the weekend with our team, but I'll come on to that. Dills, how are you? Yeah, lovely little weekend, little trip down to Swansea, um, in and out in half a day, which was good and a good result for England. So very, very happy. Thank you. Did and great hospitality in Wales. In Wales. I Did got looked after. I love it. <laughs> Through gritted teeth. You loved winning. Do you actually love Wales? Uh, yeah, it's nice. Reminds me of New Zealand a bit, actually. Um, do you know what? I haven't spent enough time down there. Um, because obviously going down there as a rugby player, an English rugby player, uh, it's not the sort of place I, I kind of ventured for holidays. Um, I've been down, I've, cl- I've climbed up Snowdon, done all that sort of thing. I've uh, been to a few weddings down there. But um, yeah, it was good. Good little trip in and out. And I'll tell you what, usually uh, it's the, the people that make that fixture so good, the, the fans. You know, like how, how workplaces, uh, households, that sort of neighbourly love uh, side of the, the game, things are, are divided and split. And it just felt a little bit weird not having that sort of um, hostility and fanfare there. But um, yeah, good result all the same. Um, good weekend. Christina, good you? Weekend. Yeah, good weekend. Just spent it pretty much just watching the rugby. But um, and put up the Christmas tree. So And watch the toy show. Uh, you guys won't get that reference, but uh, to any of our Irish listeners they'll know what the toy show is and it's just set me in the mood now for Christmas. So, well, we've a lot to get through today. So we'll start with the Autumn Nations Cup. So there was a lot of chat this weekend about the the style of international rugby that's been played uh, in particular in England's 24-13 win in Wales. A Sunday Times article said that a world rugby have been asleep at the wheel and that rugby has become a tedious kick fest. What do you guys make of this? Uh, I I thought about this today. Um, I engaged with a few few fans on, on Twitter post game. And um, do you know what? Like no one gave South Africa a stick for, you know, winning the world cup that they played a pretty defensive set piece kicking base game. And that won a world cup. And then I was kind of thinking, why is everyone playing the way they are now? Is it because South Africa won the world cup there and they almost like set the trend for the next six months, the next year. So is, is it kind of a byproduct of South Africa being su- successful doing that? And everyone trying to replicate it, Jamie. I, I don't know. Yeah, look, my my issue with this is, as a professional sport, as a game, we have a duty to entertain, um, and so rugby has to ask itself who who are those people they want to entertain. Is it the usual rugby demographic we're aware of? Middle aged man loves going to the game with his mates, enjoys the intricacies of the game, the scrum, the maul the kick pressure game, enjoy seeing that? Or do we want to bring on boards new younger fans? And if the answer is the latter, I think the game needs to adapt and the game needs to to change. If it's the former and we're just happy to keep the the traditional rugby fans happy, you know, we can carry on, continue with the way way things are. But if rugby, I think, if it wants to attract new audiences, it needs to evolve and needs to change. Um, That's, you know, that's where I sit on it. It's just if I mean, if I put myself in an eighteen year old's shoes now and I watch some of the games on telly, I probably wouldn't watch it again. But I kind if, of want some I want some out of the box thinking here today. So like I'm asking from if you were an administrator, what would you do to improve the game? And like I want specific changes, not from a coach's perspective or a player's perspective, like some out of the box thinking would be great. I'll, I'll, I'll go. I it's just for me it's space on the field. And I think we're going to see a better brand of rugby if there's more space on the field. So how do we do that? I, I like the 40-20 rule. Um, the idea of, you know, the 40-metre line and kicking into a position 22. And if you can do that, um, you get the line out. And so, you know, that, that enforces teams to then put two players in the backfield, creates more space in the front line. And you may see more teams kind of take that risk and play with ball in hand a bit more. 
uh, rather than just mitigate risk completely and put the ball up in the air off nine or ten. Um, I don't mind that rule. I'd like to see it trialled in the Northern Hemisphere because uh, I think the Northern Hemisphere is different to the Southern Hemisphere uh, with the pitches, with the weather, with the style of rugby. It's quite attritional here. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing that trial because it's only been really been trialled in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, but I wouldn't see it. Wouldn't mind seeing it trialled at a top level in the in the Northern Hemisphere. I think the um, the space thing that you you picked up on there is pretty pretty important because defences are so tight now. Um, one sensible suggestion I saw was to increase the width of the field. You know, even if you increased it by five to ten meters, so the, the the pitch is slightly wider, it stretches defenders. There's bigger gaps between defences, which people have got to be more mobile. You know, fitter, better condition to to cover those spaces. Because at the moment, it's it's literally like brick walls. But for me, the, the big debate is here for me is how do we attract new supporters to rugby? How do we get the 15-year-old kid who's watching the game at home to get excited about watching international rugby um, and want to watch it again and want to go out and play and practice the moves he's seen or whatever. And certainly when I was a kid, that you know, I saw that. I saw that when I watched Wales, when I watched the All Blacks and, you know, all these cool little moves and the, the amount of space on the pit, pitch. You envisage being that person. You went out in the field and you practiced it and you talked about it. Do you think kids now were going out and when they're 15, with their 15, 16-year-old mates practicing driving malls people suggesting like we need to speed things up or do away with those it's ridiculous because then we become a different sport altogether i think the game is good because it's inclusive there is that kind of old adage of there's a role for everyone within the team um but yeah you know scrums had a massive issue about the resets that was a theme for a while they cleaned that up you know there's hardly ever any resets anymore the sort of dead time around the scrum has picked up and um it's, it's been improved, you know? So I think where we're now, just they're going to have to look for something to just refine it, improve it, make it slightly better to watch. Because I'm, I'm with you. Like, we just don't want to watch kick, kick, kick. I want to see people with ball on hand. So looking forward to the final, France are only allowed to pick players for three of the six autumn international weekends. So the result now is that the Autumn Nations Cup final will be England versus France B. Is this a really weird climax? I think France A and a half. Uh, I don't know what it's called in France B. Um, it's strange, isn't it, for England? Because they want to, wanted to test themselves against the best French side um, possible. So they'll be disappointed with that more than anyone because they want to know where they are against you know, what has arguably been the best French side we've seen in, in a decade. Um, really, really good French side. You can understand why they've done it. You know, the league is, is strong in France. They want to protect their players, make sure they're not playing too much test rugby off the back of COVID. But it's just, it's just a frustrating spectacle now because it's arguably a, a lose-lose for England because, you know, if they lose the game, <laughs> they won't be best pleased. But if they win it, everyone's expecting them to win it now because it's a weak and French side. Yeah, I think um, the, the, the most interesting thing for England is at the start of the year, their first game of the year was against France and they actually got destroyed over in France. They had a really poor game. France were really dominant. And this was kind of like their chance to see how far they'd come um, in nine, ten months. So um, it's a shame it can't happen. But it, Jamie's right. Like, it's dangerous. It's dangerous for them. I, don't, I wouldn't call it France B. I'd call it kind of um, A- minus maybe. It's just yeah. uh, it's a shame we won't get the Dupont and Vakatawa and people like that. Um, but from an England point of view, we're going to see in a few months anyway, though, Dills. We're going to see it in a few months in the Six Nations. So as disappointing as that is, we won't see it this weekend. We're going to see a full blown France England um, in in three or four months' time. Yeah. Jamie, what did you make of the British Airways tweet um, wishing England good luck ahead of Saturday's game? Their England sponsor. What's wrong with it? Yeah. What a shambles that they've had to apologise for that. Because I went looking for the tweet and they obviously they've since took it down. So it down. I mean, that's yeah. a classic example of being like, oh, we've got to apologise for this. And then you actually look even worse for apologising. Nothing wrong with it. Be I a mean, sponsor of think... England Rugby. Yeah. Wish England Rugby well on Twitter because you're a sponsor of the team. The fact they have British in their name and they're a company representative of Britain doesn't matter one bit to me. I mean, do you think there's any Welsh people that are going to be offended by that and never fly with BA ever again? I mean, come on. I think any Welsh people who are offended by that need to have a long, hard look in the mirror. Some yeah. people just want to be offended. But guys, what were your, what were your thoughts on the game on Saturday? Uh, England deserve winners. 
Um, Wales showed some steps forward, I think. Uh, just England are in a place at the minute that you know that their machine at the minute is uh, is better than Wales is, and you know it was a it was a I wouldn't say convincing win because I think England misfired a little bit. I think they were probably played below the level they've known of themselves over the last uh, over the last month. Um, but yeah, England they're both taking steps forward, um, but England are just a more powerful machine at the minute for me. Yeah, I, I think that kind of early try by Wales kind of probably gave them belief to, to stay competitive in the game. Um, and it, it wasn't the walkover that a lot of people were predicting. Um, honestly thought it could have been a few more points than that. Um, but I think Wales, I think defensively could take some... Because for me, when I think about Wales, the epitome of Wales is defence, physicality, Jamie Roberts, big man, you know, smacking people. Still in Harley just doesn't want to run at me, does he? Well, no, I've never got the ball. Um, <laughs> always made sure I didn't get the ball. But uh, no, I think Wales took massive steps forward there. And I think when you, when you look at the game, it wasn't a game for attack because that would have played right into England's hands, you know. Well, in the build-up to Henry Slade's try, Dan Bigger was taken out in the air, but referee Roman Poit um, dismissed the TMO. Like, is that not what the TMO is for, to kind of pull the referee back to kind of look at these things? He's made a call there and then that, no, I've seen that in real time. Mm -hmm. That's not a tackle in the air. Um, if the TMO was actually come in his ear and said, look, we've got to have a look at this tackle, well, then I think he has a responsibility that t to that TMO to at least have a look at it. Just have a look at it. Like, it's one look on the screen. Um, but he was adamant that he was in the right position to see it. So, um, yeah. I, I think like because that try that shouldn't stand. Well, that should be a penalty to us. A clear and obvious tackle in the air. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, but he just hasn't trusted his TMO's decision there for some reason. I, I quite like it though. Well, and, just, and, just being like nah, nah. I'm, yeah, like I think the outcome would have been the same. So if if Danberger catches the ball, Sam Underhill tackles him anyway, right? It probably would have been a hell of a collision if he timed that perfectly. And Dan's probably thankful it didn't happen like that because Sam <laughs> Andrew actually pulled out of that tackle, kind of same outcome, caught the ball, tackled to the floor. Then he loses the ball on the floor. The ref yeah. doesn't know he's going to lose the ball on the floor. If Wales keep that ball and put seven, eight more phases together and go and score, it's a, it's a good outcome. But I like the standpoint that the ref's made an on-field decision and just gone with it. He can't really control what happens next. So just because England have scored, do you think he should go back and change his decision? Uh, yeah, no, sure. I, you know, I agree with you that he's backed his decision. I just, my, my issue comes with the fact that the TMO has come in his ear and said, you might want to look at that. And he's just gone, nah, I'm happy with what I've seen. I'm happy with what I've seen in real time. And, you know, he's trusting his instinct there, but I think the fact that TMO has come in his ear, he should have had a look at it. But there we yeah. are. We all agree to disagree, man. Absolutely. Well, what did you guys make of the Ellis Genge incident with Thomas Francis, so where some people thought that it was a headbutt? Well, I saw it what on Twitter. It came on my Twitter feed. He got pushed, didn't he? I think they got it from a scrub, and I think his mate Cowan Dickey has just launched him to the floor. I mean, it was a hell of a launch. School celebratory, like, well done, mate. Pushed him. He's pushed him straight into Thomas Francis. I don't think it's a headbutt for one minute. No, it's, it's, it's very, he's a very explosive man, and he's a very um, competitive man as well. Uh, I think this combination of things, camera angle does not help. Look, if it was a headbutt, there, there's there's overhead cameras, there's all these different angles, would be seeing it and there'd be some sort of disciplinary. I think if you actually look, his arms are outstretched and it's just the timing and how explosive it looks. A um, little bit of one-upmanship maybe, just really good scrum. Got his big loose head up and uh, got a little pinner. He's very excited. Yeah, he doesn't seem to be afraid to, to bark back either. She didn't need to tweet after the game, something really sassy about the comments and how it wasn't a headbutt or he, I know he definitely tweeted something. I was like, oh, that's cool. Well, if, he, if he's tweeting it, I'm, I'm fairly confident and he's out of the, the 24, 48 hour kind of sighting window. It's definitely not a headbutt because with that sort of um, attention on it, there's no way it was slipping through the net. So we're delighted to be joined by Mike Umaga, Managing Director of Pacific Rugby Players Welfare and a former Samoa International. Welcome, Mike. Good evening, everyone. Hope everyone's cool. So Mike, we want to talk to you about the new documentary on Amazon called Oceans Apart, Greed, Betrayal and Pacific Islands Rugby. For anyone who has not seen it yet, please tell us about it. 
Yeah, I, I think the doc, documentary, you know, obviously um, covers Dan Leo, uh, uh, for Samoan International and, and CEO of PRPW, his journey throughout, uh, um, you know, the trials and tribulations, really, of a professional Pacific Island rugby player, uh, uh, and certainly afterwards as well, um, and, and wanting to get answers um, about the issues that, you know, we've all encountered along the way um, and trying to, to, to get some change uh, in terms of governance of our unions, uh, you know, the eligibility laws, um, and also, you know, the possibility of, of you know, uh, getting a, a, a fair shake in terms of revenue share uh, from, you know, games that, you know, you need two games to, to for it to be a test match. Now, now why wouldn't, you know, there be a, a small percentage, even if it's a small percentage of uh, a home nation fixture, that's a lot of money if you, if you, you know, transfer that into island uh, dollars. So I think those are the main issues that, you know, certainly Dan set out to, to get answers for. And uh, for a lot of them, uh, I, I think he, he hit the nail on the head. So uh, I have seen it and I thought it was brilliant. Um, and I felt a little bit guilty, actually, because I obviously played with a, a whole lot of um, boys over the years. So, so Mike, is, is rugby intentionally exploiting the, the PIs at Pacific Islanders? Um, uh, it certainly seems that way, um, but you know we, we've had a lot of conversations about this, and, and um, you know it's it's probably uh, something that's been landed on on New Zealand Australia's doorstep. Really, um, you know we we talk about um, you know migration migration of our families, and you know most of our families made decisions uh, concerning their life. Uh, and the welfare of their family. So, you know, moving to New Zealand, Australia, you know, for a better life was the decision made by, certainly was made by uh, our parents um, uh, to go to New Zealand. Uh, and, and when you're in a different country, you know, you, you, you just deal with what you, you know, you've got in front of you. So, you know, going to New Zealand, it was, you know, um, you couldn't get away from being uh, a rugby player because it surrounds you every day um, the fact that you know um, they have so many talented young Polynesians uh, living in their country you know what else are they to do um, you know, but we've seen that you know progress uh, with you know there are some you know schools and uh, I don't think I'm talking out of tune by saying this there are some schools actively you know um, Getting some of those young young Polynesian boys over on scholarships. You know, we see it now; it's, it's even gone, gone more global by by France and and, and uh, Japan getting in on the act and taking you know some of the cream of uh, the the young uh, under twenties, under eighteens, going straight from Ireland and going straight to you know uh, further afield. So yeah, that money, when when a Pacific Island team plays a home union, for example. 100% of that revenue is, is kept, am I right, by the, by the home union. So yeah. is the answer a revenue share or is the answer um, the teams in the Pacific Islands hosting more test matches? I think it's, yeah, definitely that. that if, if you look back how many times, uh, you know, the home nations have, have toured over there, there's not too many in, in, in rugby's you know, long history. Yeah, I mean, I went, I went to Samoa with Wales in 2017, and I was, I was blown away. Actually, it was amazing, and I felt very privileged to, to be able to go and tour there and play there because I know this current generation of Welsh players will probably not do it in their careers again, because it won't happen for another 10 or 15 years, and that's why I yeah. felt so lucky to be able to do it. Yeah, and there's no reason why. Um, oh, well. When they tour, you know, they, they only tour, they say they tour you know, in the Southern Hemisphere, but they only tour to, you know, pretty much, you know, New Zealand, Australia or South Africa. Um, and there are some, you know, uh, good international teams in the Pacific Islands. You know, I, I, I certainly think that would definitely be a test of, of a young player's um, mental if they were go to, you know, going to play in 37 plus heat, you know, uh, stifling humidity and you certainly learn about, uh, a lot about yourself um, but also it's, it's just you know 
if, if rugby is truly global, then surely going to those islands must, must, be, must make it global. Uh, what happened to the, um, the Pacific Islanders? I, I got capped in 2008 against the PIs. And um, what, what a solution to be, to be to have that team, and this is not patronising or disrespecting the, the kind of proud heritage that each country has individually, but coming together once a year for a revenue share, Twickenham, you know, Cardiff, Murrayfield, uh, get over to Dublin, you know, like a mini tour. There's a lot of profit share there, and I don't know what the, the split could be, but could that be a good fundraiser and then people kind of disperse and go back to play for their respective nations after that? Yeah, I, I, I certainly, I, I for one of as well, you know, watch that, that team uh, with a lot of interest. Um, I was, I was, my brother was playing at the same time. Uh, he, he said it was one of the toughest series that, uh, that he ever uh, played in. Uh, but it also it was the... Uh, it was the start of you know some really uh, um, good careers for for young uh, Pacific Islanders. You know, I said to Benny Sivivatu uh, ended up playing for the All Blacks off that uh, Sione Lawaki, uh, Lawaki as well. So you know, it definitely puts them on the shop window. Um, and you know that that would definitely for me, I'd, uh, I'd love to see that happen again. But there's also it's to the British Island, British Lions in some respect. Eh? Lions or, it's a, the equivalent to the British Lions. Isn't yeah. Well, yeah. Got Wales, England, Scotland, Ireland. Every four years they come together as a collective and, and tour. And so then, I think it's that, a brilliant idea. Yeah, that, that tour could be, you know, a, a revenue maker for the islands, you know, solely for the islands. Um, I, I think there'd be a, you'd get a lot of traction out of that. Uh, but also, you know, there'd with... No the, kicking, uh, Jamie. There'd be no kicking. <laughs> 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 I've, I've got a, a young son who uh, I, I dreamed of him wearing a black jersey or blue jersey, mate. So, mate, he's, uh, he's uh, possibly, possibly uh, going to wear a white one, so... I mean, how, how cool is that for you? I, I went into camp the other day and I saw him there and, geez, he looks young. He's, a, he's <laughs> only a small fella. But, um, I mean, you must be so proud, like, seeing him kind of in there doing that. How's he finding it? Yeah, no, he's, he's enjoying it, mate. He's, he's learning loads. Um, and, and I guess that's all you, you want from your, from your kids, um, enjoying the experience. Um, you know, he's around some, some world-class rugby players. Um, but... Uh, I, 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 I know his mum's scared <laughs> um, because because she like you mate he, he looks he does look young and uh, I'm not sure if he's uh, totally filled out yet so I, I, I don't know if she'd be too happy if he does get a cap. It'd be dangerous with those. Um... Very, yeah, he's held himself very well in the Premiership, mate. So that's probably the most attritional league of the lot. So uh, I'm yeah. sure he's all right. No, he's, he's definitely got uh, got enough speed to get himself out of trouble, mate. Something I uh, I never had, so yeah, I think you'd be fine. I mean, without um, I'm sure he won't mind saying is is his role clear within that group? Has Eddie kind of said to him, "You're here as an apprentice," or is he there to push Owen and George, or is he just there to learn? What what's what's his story? Yeah, I think it's more the uh, the 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 learning. Uh, because if, if we look at um, probably how Eddie's selected the squad over this, in these last few games, really you think about it and yeah, they're, they're really, uh, other than Georgia possibly, there is really no opportunity for him to, uh, to, to play really. Um, and they're going into a final this week. Uh, and although he's in camp this week, you know, it's, it's definitely about the learning of it. And so... Um, now, now, whether that's um, uh, learning a different way, because you know, obviously, Wasp play totally different to to how uh, England play. So, maybe it's I don't know whether it's a reprogramming or <laughs> or what. So, he does say that he spends a lot of lot of time kicking. Yeah, he'd uh, be like but, a sponge. He'll be he'll be loving it. Yeah. Well, thanks for that, Mike. I think we can let you go now. So um, I suppose, yeah, like the, the documentary really is quite the eye-opener. And thanks for coming on and kind of talking with us today. Best of luck to Jacob with England, I suppose. And um, yeah, yeah, thanks for, for joining us. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Mike. Nice Appreciate it. See you later.
Right, so guys, I want to know about the process of post-game analysis under Eddie Jones and Warren Gatland. So how did it work? What th things did they pick up on? Was it a conversation or was it more one-sided? You know, Jamie, I'm going to ask you to go first, give Dylan a bit of time to think about what he wants to say about Eddie. Uh, right, post-game analysis for Wales. Uh, revolved around a few things. Firstly, you'd come in on a Monday morning and Sean Edwards, uh, in typical Sean Edwards fashion, would have, you'd, ha you'd have a projector with a big screen in the middle of the team meeting room uh, with numbers one to 23 and basically a sentence about what what he thought about your defensive performance. <laughs> I'd see you walk into breakfast, first thing in the morning, you'd see this big screen and it was basically number one, Great effort, pal. Dominant hits. Number two, what the F was that on minute 23? Number three, solid line speed. Keep it going. <laughs> and you go through all the team, but all your teammates to see what you thought of it. And I thought that was quite powerful. They, they would do exactly the same with your GPS stats uh, and your efforts and everything. They pin it up on the board so everyone could see everyone's results. Uh, so you're always comparing with your peers. Uh, so, you know, you felt really good about yourself if your stats were high, you felt embarrassed if they were low or you covered kind of low meters. Uh, so we put that kind of kept that tension within the group and that put that pressure on you. Um, and then you, do, you, you just have a review. You, you have a review, you know, they don't they didn't pick, pick the bones out of everything about the game, but just common trends in the game where we got stuff wrong, where we can improve, highlighted good things, highlighted work rates um, with players. And then you put it to bed. You put it to bed. It was important that on after that Monday, the following week was gone, and and then it was about the next week. You know, we didn't didn't uh, kind of dwell on things, but it was quite ruthless, quite ruthless at times. And I guess in that high performance environment, um, it had to be. I mean, Gats, you know, he, he loved pushing buttons with players. Um, I remember after row nine, you know, after the Lions, um, you know, I was doing quite a lot of media stuff, you know, with different sponsors, I was in, press, in the press quite a bit and whatever. And I remember just in front of the lads, I think it would have been the, the autumn series in 09, um, just we were about to go out for a team session. And he's just gone, Jamie, any danger in you concentrating on your rugby? And all the lads just walked out of the room and literally I felt that small, you know, proper embarrassment in front of everyone. Um but, it, it, you know, it triggered something inside me that I was like, oh, God, okay, maybe I am, you know, concentrating on stuff off the field probably a bit too much uh, than on it. Um, and, you know, I think I played well that weekend and continue to play well. So he loved doing that. He loved he loved just chucking in grenades and kind of pushing buttons with certain players with, you know, that buttons he felt the need of pushing in. All right, so let's talk about Ireland's win over Georgia at the weekend. 23-10 with two drives controversially ruled out. Uh, one of the incidents was with ref Matthew Reynal said that Ireland didn't go to ground on the ball and was dismissive of the Irish captain James Ryan when he asked for it be, to be referred to the TMO. Again, another French ref. French refs, eh? French refs. I think, uh, look, I, I think they're awesome, as good as any other refs. What I will say is I played in France for a few years and winning away from home was far more challenging than winning at home. Uh, and you can put down that to loads. You put that down to loads of factors, um, especially French players playing away from home. But the, I think the ref was a massive, massive thing. Certainly domestically in in France, like every everything goes against you if you're away from home. You, to have any chance of winning, you have literally not got to go in a ruck. Like if, if you if you go in a ruck and compete, they'll ping you. They'll find something to ping against you. It was almost impossible to win away from home. Have you uh -huh. found guys that like French refs do run the game differently to the English speaking ones? I wouldn't say English speaking because some of them English are better, Irish better English than me. Um, I'd say, you know, when you do analysis, we were just talking about that earlier. You look at players, you look at teams, they've got themes. Refs also have themes, you know, guys that um, favor certain decisions, you know, not rolling away quick enough. They allow a little bit more time on a jackal. Um, they have themes. I think the theme with French refs is there is no theme. They're a little bit like the players, a little bit unpredictable. And for me, I always loved um, the French refs. I don't know why, but we always seem to get on really well. I mean, I got carded by plenty, but for me, they let the game just flow. It was a little bit easier, a little bit messier at times, a little bit scrappier in the breakdown. But for me, really good refs, good to communicate with, no nonsense, you know, bit of humour chucked in there. I thought they were really good. Yeah, that's a good point. They're instinctive, aren't they? 
and it's think different the way they play the game um, and certainly in the way they ref as well. So it's it's hard to find trends uh, in French referees. Don't you know? Don't hit the nail on the head there. So before we get on to the All Blacks v Argentina, we have a new sponsor this week, and they've sent you both something, haven't they? Yes, thank you very much, Manscaped. I have a full box of top-of-the-range male grooming products. Uh, my daughter, she groomed me. Uh, my nose, though, she put the nostril weed whacker <laughs> trimmer <laughs> so weird. up my nose, and she she had you know she really went for it. So my nose is uh, lacking hairs, which is good news. Okay. She actually tried to shave the top of my nose, and I had to tell her to put it in it. But um, no, very good kit. Thank you very much, Manscaped. Lovely. I'm looking forward to the ball deodorant. Ball yeah. deodorant? Oh, wow. Active pH control. I'm not sure what that means to me. In my downstairs bit. But yeah, thank you very much, Manscaped. Looking forward to it. Very nice. Well, you can get 20% off everything at manscaped.com using the code offload. So go and check them out. Right. Well, on a more sour note, Matera has gone from hero to zero in a couple of weeks. He's been stripped of the captaincy and suspended along with two other players for racist tweets he posted nine years ago about black people, as well as Bolivian and Paraguayan maids. There is absolutely no place in the game or society from that. I know he came out and he apologized. He said, um, I think he tweeted, I had a tougher time. I'm very ashamed. Apologies to all those who were offended by the atrocities I wrote. You know, guys, what do you make of this? You know, how long do you think, you know, World Rugby should be banning him for? Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what World Rugby do. Um, you know, whether he said that yesterday, four years ago, eight years ago, it's, it's desperately unacceptable, let alone in the public sphere. So, you know, and he's paid the price. You know, he's going to be, I guess, reflecting on his past and being, being gutted he's actually said that. I'm sure he's a different man now than what he was eight years ago. But even still, you know, you, you can't say things like that or think even think things like that as I said let alone in a public sphere yeah 100% agree uh, unfortunately for him he's he's gonna have to to live with that um, you know it's got so many implications you know obviously reputational damage you know is he gonna be able to get a job is he gonna be able to you know what club will sign him um, will he play international rugby again uh, who knows? So he's going to have to live with that. And do you know what? I was, I was thinking that the best thing this weekend is, is rainbow laces. And it's a good reminder um, to people that don't know about rainbow laces is that our games for, for all, it's an inclusive game. And so if you see those this weekend, um, get behind that little campaign. Well, that's it from us. Thanks to Mike Umaga, Dylan Hartley and JB Roberts. And thanks to you for listening. More offloading next week. Make sure to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts so you get it as soon as it's released. Leave us a rating and review if you can. And don't forget to check us out on YouTube as well. Thanks, guys. Thanks for seeing Thank you.